comes from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Every athlete is on this quest. Every performer dives in head first, battling real life challenges and overcoming obstacles in an effort to make their dreams reality. reality. Singer, songwriter, 15 year WWE host Lillian Garcia was the first woman to ever announce WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. And the first to launch her own podcast, which gives you an all access pass to the human interest stories of elite athletes and extraordinary entertainers. Now, let's embark on another fascinating journey of chasing glory with your host, Lillian Garcia. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Chasing Glory, where it gets real, raw, and inspiring. You guys, my CG squad out there, you keep me going. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for following me at Lillian Garcia on Instagram and Twitter and Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. And of course, our Chasing Glory podcast page, which is at Chasing Glory podcast on Instagram. Okay, I have to say that I had the most amazing weekend. Actually, it was kind of like a Friday thing. But I went to Chicago. I went there on Thursday. And because Friday, I had Ace Comic Con that I was moderating the panels with none other than Little Miss Bliss, Alexa Bliss, with the Intercontinental Champion, Seth Rollins, and of course, the Bella Twins. Yeah, I got to hang out with Nikki and Bree. Love them both dearly. Everyone was so amazing. And the fans, you guys that were there, I mean, really, I kept saying how the Chicago air and the Chicago like environment and you guys like just everything was just vibrating. It was amazing. It was so much fun. So thank you for making the panels so great. And it was because of you guys, seriously. Thank you for that. Thank you for coming by and saying hi in my booth and for taking picture with me. I always just love meeting all of you face to face and giving you a huge hug, a huge, huge hug. So another person that I want to thank for sure is Stone Cold Steve Austin, my friend. I love that we've stayed in contact after all these years. My beer drinking friend, <laughs> he invited me to be on his podcast last Thursday. So make sure that you guys check that out. It was so much fun. We talked about a lot of stuff. Everyone was saying how much they enjoyed the podcast. So check out Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast, which is the Steve Austin show. And uh, check us out talking, like I said, about everything. And today, of course, I have someone very special on the show. But before I talk about her, I want to thank my last week's guest, Paige. She was great as always. Love that girl. I love everything she shares. You know, the thing about Paige, she's just an open book. And she's the first one to be like, you know what? Some things don't always go right in my life. And sometimes I don't make the best choices and I learn every single day. And I'm like, she says, I'm 26 years old and I'm still like just in it. And she is, she's on a huge platform and she's growing up in front of the world. So Paige, thank you so much for sharing everything that you did. And today it leads me to your mom. So here's what happened. Soraya Knight. Yes, she's incredible. I wanted to have someone that represented the female independent wrestlers because leading up to evolution, it is those wrestlers too that partook in this. They are the ones that did the grind that really, and there's a lot, a lot of WWE female superstars that came from the independent scene. So, and Paige being one of them, as a matter of fact. So yeah, her mom uh, really was brilliant in this episode and just really opening up real raw and extremely inspiring. But also guys, um, you're going to prepare yourselves because this conversation went in places that I had no idea everything that she had endured in life. And I'm just really amazed that this woman has been able to handle everything that has happened to her. But thank God she has. Thank God she has. Because A, we needed Paige in this world. And yeah, she talks about how she did. Um, this is Soraya Knight. She did contemplate, so, or not really contemplate. She actually tried to commit suicide. So we, like I said, it's going to get real. It's going to get really real. But she's very 
much in a place to be helping others. And that is what she's doing. She's extending a hand. So without further ado, here is Soraya Knight's journey of chasing glory. The life and times of Julia Hamer Beavis is definitely a textbook of tragedy and triumph. A troubled teen, Julia was the unfortunate victim of abuse and actually ran away from home and would use the public swimming pools to bathe herself. She was also turned to drugs, but after an overdose, she was determined to get clean. Around the same time, she would meet her future husband, Ricky Knight, where she would begin to travel with him in the British wrestling scene. After a few months, Julia would become his valet and would be known as Soraya Knight, but soon realized that being outside the ring just wasn't enough, so she wanted to become a professional wrestler. Throughout the next few years, she would remain active and would also help her husband's promotion, World Association of Wrestling, by helping manage the shows as well as training students at the academy. Motherhood would enter Soraya's life as she unknowingly wrestled while being seven months pregnant. That child inside her womb would end up being two-time Divas champion and the current SmackDown general manager Paige. After Paige entered the pro wrestling world as well, Soraya would team up with her daughter and on a regular basis even travel to the United States to wrestle for the promotion Shimmer. They even wrestled each other in a no disqualification match before Paige would sign with the WWE. Soraya is still very active in the wrestling scene and still manages shows for her promotion, Bellatrix Female Warriors. In 2012, a documentary about her family was produced entitled The Wrestlers Fighting With My Family, which received rave reviews and is being turned into a full-length motion picture, which is being produced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and set to release in March of 2019. It's about to get real, Raw and inspiring with Soraya Knight. All right, representing the women in the hard independent circuit, and that is Soraya Knight is on. She is Paige's mom, and I'm so honored to have you on Chasing Glory. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hi, darling. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm buzzing, to be fair, because I, yeah. Love it. I love your stuff. Oh, thank you. I'm so, that makes me feel so good. I know that you've been, you said that you've been listening for a while and you've listened obviously to Paige when she was on the very first time. I was so honored. I was so, so honored that Paige actually chose my podcast to go on and I thought it was so profound. And, you know, I went back when I asked her to come back and return for this one leading up to evolution, which I can't wait to talk to you about. Um, I, I had... I had it in my mind. I'm like, you know what? She brings you up a lot. And then, you know, your whole story. And I know that you guys have your movie that's going to be coming out. Also, I think it's next March that The Rock did. That's crazy. And we'll talk about that. (laughs) Fighting with my family. Um, But, you know, hearing little bits and pieces of your story, I was like, wow, this woman has a tale to tell. And I think that it's going to be so powerful for people out there to hear it. Um, I also, again, leading up to evolution, I was thinking about all the women wrestlers that are in the independent circuit and how hard, how hard you work for the love of wrestling. And a lot of independent wrestlers do not get to the WWE and, you know, get to the fruits of labor, put it this way of, you know, more pay and, um, being, it's not, it's a little bit more plush, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, a, it's more job security as well. Yeah. That's you know, too. contractually. So, I mean, it, it, like everyone, everybody wants to get to the fed and um, the fed is the ultimate. I mean, who wouldn't want to go and, and show their face on WrestleMania? I mean, right. they are the ultimate. So it is a, it is an avenue that many people, um, want to tread. Absolutely. But you know, the, the money is there every week. You don't have to worry about anything. Um, if you injured, you, you know, the money is still there, even, you know, might not be as much as what you'd earn, but you're still looked after. You're looked after in every single way, shape and form with the fed. So, you know, when you're an independent circuit a wrestler, if you get injured, it's that's yeah, it. That's it done. until you heal. Unless you have friends around you that kind of do the GoFundMe's or stuff like that. It is very hard 
if you get injured on the independent circuit to survive. So, well, you're somebody yeah. that have definitely been on the independent circuit for so long. And I want to get your story. Uh, first of all, before we go into all of that, how did it feel for you to hear about women's, um, you know, this all women's pay-per-view that's coming up evolution? <sighs> To be honest, it's astounding because you've got to remember we were a bathroom break for a long, long time. And um, on the independent circuit, I remember going out to like houses of less than 10 and mm. half of those people were, were people that came with wrestlers. You know, mm. um, they, I, I remember like doing like a few years, quite a few years because I've been doing this job 28 years now. So, wow. you know, um, we, there's usually like a five year turnaround on the, on the independent circuit where it goes to its heights and then it, it kind of balls down again. But the, um, the, the female side of wrestling that is now being taken more seriously and the influx of, of women that we've got on the independent circuit, um, you know, the WWE had to, they had to honor the amount of work that the girls on the Indies are doing. And not just that, they've opened the door for a lot more indie girls to actually get into the Fed. Yeah. Whereas before it was a certain look, a certain waistline, a certain style, a certain feature. Um, now it's a case of if you can work, you're there. And, mm. and I think that is a huge, huge, big, huge step forward. And obviously the WE are leading the way. But yeah. I, I, I think that they are they're, they're doing it right. They are doing it right. And it's all shapes and sizes. And that's what I love about it is that anybody can now go to the WWE, which it should have always been like that really. But now, nowadays it's like any, the dream is there in, in reach with anybody. They can't look at themselves and go, I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm, you know, I'm not right. And they, and they become self-critical. That's all gone. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing about this, this evolution that's going on at the minute is that, Every girl that has that dream can now walk the walk. And that I think is amazing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it became uh, the awareness got there because of the Mae Young Classic too, which will be represented at Evolution because that's where the Oh, how amazing is that? I know. That is is an open door. Uh, I mean, I I know literally 99.9% of the girls uh, that was on both the Mae Youngs. And I mean, there's some real decent fighters amongst that lot i mean i'm not saying that the, the you know there's good and the bad but there's levels there's levels and everything yeah there's there's girls that wouldn't necessarily get a contract with the wwe but can still walk on the stage and that's just another thing that the fed has done is it's kind of opened up this little pocket where the indie girls now have got things in reach and the may young classic was probably the biggest step forward that they've done it's i mean the women's Re- revolution has, has been going on for a little while but the, the girls are standing up and we're being taken notice of and, and the Fed is leading the way. So that's really cool. Yeah. So what was it about wrestling? I mean, early on for you, I, I definitely want to get your, your story leading up for it. But, but what was it a specific about wrestling that really turned you on? Uh, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, huh? <laughs> that's it. No, that really is it. I, I, I met and fell in love with a wrestler. And, um, I would literally, like I will now, I'll, I'll walk to the ends of the earth for him and with him and alongside him. And, you know, you've to, to be married or to be with a wrestler, you've got to have a certain mentality. Now you either join them or you, you kind of accept them, Yeah. but you can't moan about their way of life because that's just how it is. And, uh, I met and fell in love with a wrestler and decided that I was going to be by his side at whatever cost. And my husband, uh, well, fiance at the time, (laughs) I did that. He would teach me on the roads and I literally came straight out of a normal job and went straight on the road. And, and my husband taught me as we went. So, you know, it was an amazing, an amazing experience for four long years though. Really? Four long years. Yeah. Yeah. No, in those days it was very, very hard, especially for women. Um, And my husband had this idea of women being taken seriously as wrestlers and fighters first and leave the way they look till last. And his his dream has always been to have um, two women in a ring wrestling and being taken as seriously as the guys on the bill. And that was that was his dream from, you know, from the day I met him. And he, that's why he, he gave me a different a different stance, a different way. He he formatted me different. He taught me the guys way to wrestle because in the days that I was brought in, the females had a style and the males had a style and there was no crossover. So mm-hmm. there was female moves and male moves. Um, but my husband wanted 
wanted me to be different, wanted me to be taken seriously as a fighter first. And then, you know, maybe people can then say, well, she's, she's, she looks all right. Or, I, you know, or, you know, which they can make their opinion of the way I look after they'd seen me fight. Wow. So um, he taught me how to look after myself in and out of the ring. Um, I was his manager S for many years. Um, and he was like top of the game. When I, when I came in the job, I did kind of come in the back door because he was uh, part of the Superflies, which was him and Jimmy Ocean. And they, they would wrestle, in fact, Robbie Brookside and Doc Dean. Wow. So they would be the circuit. And obviously there was no um, internet or anything like that. So you'd be working every day of the week, begging for a day off. We would do 300 and probably about 340 days a year. Wow. We'd, you know, we'd literally beg for a day off. So you learn your craft and you hone it very quickly in those days because you're out there every day. You're out there working every day. So uh, when when Rick taught me about the manager in about understanding the 360 vision of watching your back, watching your wrestlers back, keeping an eye on what's going on, because obviously a manager is the first point of call for when it erupts. And in the days I started, nine times out of ten, I'd have to fight my way out of, a, out of a venue, back to back with my husband or, you know, and I've taken many hidings. Wow. Many, many hidings. Really? Um, oh, God, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the worst kicking that I have ever received was in Maidstone in Kent. And uh, it was a, it was an area that was, it was quite run down and there was quite a large... Um, you know, like a, a, it was a rough estate. It was everything about it was rough. And, and I don't might mean that disrespectfully in any way, shape or form, but the people in that lived in that area had to be able to look after themselves. And um, I had a whole venue full of them. <laughs> and uh, I remember um, my husband saying to me, look, Jules, um, just be careful. They, they don't mess about here. Keep your eyes, to, you know, do your 360, always keep an eye on what's going on. And, you know, like, obviously he was, he's, like, awesomely protective over me anyway. But he, he also remembered, like, realized that he had to work in the ring. So his focus would be taken away. And I had to learn the hard way on the outside to, you know, get a few smacks in the mouth, before, you know, so that I learn to kind of look around me. Wow. And I remember, I remember grabbing hold of the wrestler that my husband had put on the ropes and the wrestler had, and, and Rick had then turned the referee. And as I've grabbed hold of him, um, I think it might have even been. It was. Either, I think it was might have been Doc Dean. So I think Robbie was on the on the other side, or might I? Don't, I can't remember the, the wrestler. And I remember getting a punch on the side of the face that knocked me out, and I was still standing. Oh my god! Uh, I remember not being aware of what was going on, and then next thing I know. I just felt a huge crowd around me and the punches, there were so many people around me. They were actually keeping me on my feet. Um, and I was getting, I had my coccyx broken. I looked like the elephant man, like literally my face, my nose was broken. My, my, my body was in bits and I had a gold lame dress on and they literally ripped the dress off me and I had cuts down my back and uh, my husband and his tag partner had seen the commotion because obviously in the beginning they thought, oh, my God, we're getting good heat here. And then when they turned around, I was getting a kick in of my life outside. But the crowd were holding me up and my husband could see that I was there. But trying to get to me again was a different matter. Wow. So I remember, I remember as I, um, in my head, I kept thinking, stay on my feet. Just stay. If, I, if, I'd gone to, if I'd gone to ground, I'd be dead. Yeah. Because it was, it was literally a riot. And uh, I remember... One of the wrestlers came running from backstage, um, a, a gentleman called uh, Soldier Boy, Steve Prince. And um, he he grabbed me, and I remember him putting me over his shoulder, and they were still hitting me on the back of the neck and on the head and trying to whip like, my hair out. Um, as he was running with me, they were pulling me back. Um, so I, I do remember all of that, but apparently I don't really remember what was happening in the, in the locker room. And... Um, I was actually with uh, Steve Prince uh, about a month ago and he filled me in um, and I was unconscious. I was completely knocked out and they put me on a table backstage and while my husband and his tag partner were desperately trying to get back to me, but obviously the crowd then had, had got into revolt. Wow. Um, the guys backstage, like the Skull Murphys and, uh, and Soldier Boy and stuff, they had alcohol strips and where I was unconscious on the table... <laughs> They put their wrestling, their towels and everything under my head. And by the time my husband burst through the door to make sure I was still alive, they'd already bathed my my bruises and my cuts. And 
um, they 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 brought me round, and you know they were all really really worried. But I think the the actual moral to that to the story really is never always face your fears. Never ever ever be too scared to go into a situation because two weeks later the promoter rang up and said to my husband, I need you back at Maidstone. Mm. And the person on my body and on my face and the swelling was only just going down. And and I said to my husband, I, said, I can't do it. I can't. I, there's no there's no way, Rick. I can't go through that again because I've never had a kick in like it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was in a bad, bad way. And even the thought of traveling the two and a half hours to the venue with a broken coccyx was enough to terrify me. Jeez. But I looked horrendous. I mean, I, I, I was cut, I was bruised, I was swollen. And I could hardly move, to be honest. Uh, my body was very, very stiff and sore from the kicking I'd got. And um, my husband, he turned around, he looked me in the eye, he went, we are going down there and you will walk out there. He said, because you are not showing fear. Mm. He said, I'm not, I show fear. He said, you're going to go out there and you're going to hold your head up and you're going to turn around and say to them, if that's the best you can do, bring it on. He said, you know, that, that is how it's going to be. He said, there's no way you're going to bottle from this. So all the way down, obviously, I was very quiet and I was extremely scared, extra, like petrified. And um, I remember when, when the music hit and the Superfly's music hit and I, I can remember my body shaking so hard that I couldn't actually put one foot in front of the other. I was that terrified of going out. And the, the crowd knew that my, like myself and my husband and everyone were going to be there. So there was double the amount of people that was there the fortnight before. Mm. And um, I remember Rick goes, go on, off you go, because I always walked in front. And he, he whispered it, he told me that it, just before I was going, he goes, I love you and you can do this. He said, but say what you've got to say, he says, and get straight back to the change room. You are not going to stay out there this time. I just want you to go straight back. So I remember walk, everyone was there and they were all baying for blood and everything. And I remember getting in the ring and getting on the microphone and just saying, look at me, if this is the best you guys can do, I say bring it on. Wow. And then when I walked with my head held high back through that crowd. Obviously there was people there that was watching me to make sure I was safe because my husband would never let me do that unless I was being protected because he had to stay in the ring. Yeah. And um, I walked back through everybody with my head held high. And I remember thinking to myself when I actually got backstage and my legs went because I was petrified and mm-hmm. I'm not ashamed to say that I was petrified. When my, when I actually um, realized what I'd done, I swore to myself that from that day onwards, I would face anything, no matter how scared I was, no matter how it made me feel, I would face my fears 110% because nothing, if I could do that, I could do anything. Wow. And from that to this day, that was probably one of the strongest lessons my husband has taught me is never be afraid, always face your fears. And all right, it was in a, it was a long, long time ago, many, many years ago, but I've, that's carried me through right the way through my life. I'm not scared of nothing. I, I will face anything head on, no matter what. I will look at dead square in the eye and I'll deal with it. And, you know, that is, that's a lesson from wrestling. So wrestling does teach you stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. What an amazing story. I mean, it's very intense, but you just said it. The lesson, I mean, it was, I always say there's a silver lining to everything. And I could see that that's a huge silver lining. And I feel like you instilled that in Paige because I see that in Paige too, that she's gone through a lot and yeah, I mean, she's gotten knocked down and, um, there's thoughts that she's had and she even, you know, spoke about how, um, you know, when the scandal broke out last year, she really wanted to commit suicide and all, but I'm sure that. Yes. I, I, I can find I was there. I, yeah. I, many times where I was on the end of the phone and, you know, to hear your little girl come out with those words when you gave them life yeah, and they voluntarily want to take it away. And that's the biggest gift you can give anybody is, is the a reason to live. Yeah. Um, but to actually give somebody the breath that they're breathing, you know, um, and hear the, the pain, the pain that you hear when your kids are broken is, is, is horrendous. But what people have got to realize about, um, Paige, um, is that she's human Yeah. and you know, people make mistakes. The only difference is her mistakes are on a larger stage and there's more people critical and wanting to jump on her. Um, you know, that the child is human and I've, I've spent many an hour and many a day talking to her, being there for her, being in the background and just, just, you know, like all the family are, my whole family, we're all, all of us are always there for her. 
But it is it is desperately sad that people they 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 know her as their character, but they don't know her as Soraya Jade. Um, and to me, she's Soraya Jade. And it, you know, some of the stuff I see and I read and stuff she's gone through, and you know how, how people are so. Um, well, the trolls, they're, they're so evil, Yeah. evil. It's, you know, and uh, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's extremely hard when, when your child is broken to try and, especially when you're 4,000 miles away, that's, to try and extend to fix, you know. Yeah, that's got to be the hardest. And I know that she said that, you know, when everything did go uh, to a certain point, she did go home and then she was in the hospital there. How were you able to handle all of that? Oh, I was a wreck. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to tell you that, um, you know, when your child goes through something as a mother, you go through it too. Mm-hmm. You, you feel every emotion, you see it. And it, and like, Oh my God. Um, you know, I, I adore all of my kids. Um, they've all been through their trials and tribulations. Um, I think where Saray was concerned, um, she's got the, the family spirit of like, come on, bring it on. You know, I'll face you. I'll look you in the eye. And I'll face you, and I'll deal with it. But they've also got to remember that everyone has a limit, and she has a limit. Yeah. You know, and when when you, when she gets to that overload, she she does suffer panic attacks. She does. She is overcritical of herself. She's she's a council house girl that's done good. She's you know we're, we we never we we never came into money. We've never had money. We've always you know lived by our means. We've you know, we've, we've gone out, she's put rings up, she's, she's done all the crappy jobs, you know, to get where she is today. She's a normal, everyday girl, and mistakes will be made because we're not all perfect. And to go from one extreme to the other, there's obviously going to be big mistakes made, but it's, the over, it's, it's people being overcritical that is going to, is, is what affects Paige more than anything is, you know, well, why are they saying that? I don't understand why they're saying that. And she's just so critical of herself. But she'll she'll bounce through. Whatever she does, she'll bounce through because, she number one, she's my girl. Number two, she's her dad's girl. Uh, she's a knight, but she's, she's honest. So whatever happens, whatever comes out of her mouth, it comes from the heart, and she's honest. So, yeah. you know, well, she'll, she'll be honest. She'll find her feet. Yeah, that's what I, I love about her. And I love her transition from from what she went through last year and then how she's now SmackDown's general manager. It's it's amazing. And yeah, if she did lose her career in the, you know, in the ring, which I'm sure was painful. I can imagine it was painful for you. Like, I would love to hear what it was like for you. You're, you know, an independent wrestler for so long and you're trying to get, I'm sure, like you said, your goal was always to someday be in the WWE. Um, and then she ends up being in the WWE, how that is for you as a mom to watch her and then also be able to handle that she loses her career in the ring. To be honest, um, I always thought that the WWE was out of my reach. Really? It was something, yeah, because um, nowadays it's in the girls' reach. If I started my career like in the last five years, then that would be as much my, my territory as anybody else's. I've got as much chance as anybody else. But in the days that I got brought in, there was, there was never that option. It mm. was a closed grip, and the women, absolutely not. You know the the women that were there with, that were, were worked. Yeah. So I always wanted to go on the independent circuit and ply my trade and earn my money and and do it that way. So I thought that if I ever managed to get there, I mean, obviously it's a dream come true. But I just never thought that I would be be capable of going that far. Um, when when Soraya or sorry Paige, when she got in. I remember me and her dad crying our hearts out because that is like, it's like the, the, the ultimate, you know, you know, to see your little girl up there and doing her stuff and, you know, sticking moves in that she's learned down at your school. And, yeah. and then you see, you see other girls on, on, on the show and they, they're like, Oh, I know that move. I know that pages has taught that move because that's like, that's a British wrestling move. So, <laughs> you know, she, it was really cool to kind of see the girls do stuff. And it's like, Oh, she's making my stuff. Oh, you know, so you, you, it was just, I was so proud. I mean, I, I remember like her dad, her dad is like everything she's ever done, everything she's ever said, every podcast she's ever done. Rick is a page connoisseur. He knows everything and anything there is to know about Raya. Wow. Um, I'm more on the, um, you know, how she is domestically 
as Soraya Jade. Yeah. Her dad is her biggest fan, but also her biggest critic. Mm-hmm. So when when she got in there and she was doing so well and everything, and then she she told us quite a time before, like the usual thing, Mom, Dad, this is happening, don't say nothing, which is the norm. Don't say nothing, but that's usually <laughs> what we get. Um, you know, it's like, you know, we're getting used to this. We, used to, we made mistakes in the early days she was there because, when, you know, we, we, we weren't given the media talks and stuff, so we did put our foot in it quite a lot. But we <laughs> learned the hard way to keep our opinions to ourselves and not say anything and just let the fans speak for themselves, you know. Sometimes it's really difficult because yeah. you just want to punch them in the, you know, but you have to rise above it because it's all about opinions and you cannot think that your opinion is right. Right. It's just that's just not how the world works. So we've learned the hard way to shut up. And when Rhea told us, because she she actually rang us when she came out of the doctors, when she just found out the news, and she was snot bubbling everywhere. Um, you know, the girl was devastated because you got remember she hasn't known anything else. Right. She doesn't know anything else. She's never had a normal job. She couldn't do a normal job. My God, she she'd be running the place in like, like two days. Yeah. She's just. She's she's a go getter, and when she she was like, like I need to speak to my dad, and because obviously she's a bit of a dad's girl, and you know Rick sat with her, and you know kind of said to her, look, girl, I've always said there's more to life than wrestling for you, and, you know, even though wrestling is his life, he always knew that she was meant to be something more, something big, something great, something you know, and you know once I spoke to Ray myself, it's like, girl, let's see what happens. You know, never say never. Let's let's just take it stages at a time and get your operation done, and then we can go from there. Mm-hmm. But then, obviously, as it unraveled, and then it's like, Mum, Dad, I've I've got to retire. And uh, I think we knew about about two months, three months beforehand, mm-hmm. and it was it was hell, absolute hell, because obviously she went through the transition then, and we had to keep it quiet. So she was ringing us up on her bad days after she'd been down the training centre and not been allowed in the ring. Um, you know, she was diving about everywhere, but she wasn't allowed to do certain stuff anymore. And then she had to rest. And then she wasn't allowed to be, you know, anywhere near it because, you know, she had to heal. And she went stir crazy. Absolutely, completely and utterly stir crazy because she just wanted so desperately to get back into the ring. Yeah. And, you know, and then... When it finally came that um, she was going to be doing the the Monday Night Raw segment, um, myself and my husband, we're, we're, we were good until the tear came. Hmm. And as soon as that tear rolled down her face, we were just blubs. We yeah. were just sniveling idiots. But what I really respect the Fed for more than anything is they knew she was hurting. They were there for it. We couldn't be there. So they were mum, dad, brother, sister, and everything to her. Mm. And what I loved about it was that the day that she gave her retirement speech, which obviously there was a build-up to, and that was the crescendo. So that was when it was going to be a relief, but it was also the final word. And then out the bag, what do they do? They bring her to SmackDown and make a general manager. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Talk about going from snotting and crying and blubbering to pride and, oh, my God, and what are they doing to us? What are they doing to us? <laughs> Me, too. I remember reaching out to her that night. I was so sad. I'm like, oh, my God, I had no idea you were going to retire. I'm so sorry. You know, all this kind of stuff. To then the next night going, wait, what? <laughs> Congratulations. Was, crying and she was like, oh, mom, oh, dad, and oh. And then it's like, because um, she didn't tell us. She didn't tell us. Well, she said we she didn't was, know. Yeah, but that was the thing. We just got a message um, on the Tuesday, really quite late on, about, about I can't think what it was. I know it's about nine, I think it's about nine o'clock our time. Oh. And it's like, what? Smackdown. <gasps> and we're like, oh, no, she's got to do a retirement speech on Smackdown. And oh, my God. <laughs> oh, we've got to go for it again. But she didn't tell us. So the next thing you know, we're all there, ready with the hankies, ready to go through all over again, and she comes out as general manager of SmackDown. <laughs> it was like, the Fed, I love to hate you. You are, ah. Oh. oh, my but, God. Yeah, it's amazing. And they love her, and they look after and they do look after her. You know, they, they do. And yes. give her that, that position, I thought, was incredible. You know, it shows how, how valuable she, she is or how much they value her. Yeah. For you know, from retirement speech and go, actually – Let's give you another job. 
<laughs> Not right. just any job. We'll give you the job. Yeah. And to me, that was just just something that was extremely special, and I'll always thank them for that because they've always been in the background. You know, all through Ray's injury, they've always been there. Yeah. And they've been, been reaching out. So, you know, myself and my husband and my family have got a huge amount of respect for the feds and the way that they they look after our little girl. Because you've got to remember, she's their product. She's our baby. Right. So, you right. know, we, we, we do respect what they're, you know, how they look after and watch out for and stuff. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. It is kind of cool. Well, I definitely want to get more into your story because I want to know more about you because she tells me, you know, what an amazing story you have, but, but full of ups and full of downs. I mean, you obviously were born in England and tell me about, like, I know that, you know, I've heard that you were abused by your stepfather. What age did you like, give me a little bit of, of background as to how long before you got it with your stepfather and what life was like for you before that? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I mean, I lived in a little tiny fishing village uh, right down the bottom end of near Land's End. It's a little place called Penzance. Um, and it's it, like literally, you know, everybody knows everybody. And um, I I remember like vaguely, you know, growing up in the same house and, and friends and, you know, long summers and going down to the, the beach and to the rocks and, you know, rock pooling and stuff. And um I remember my mum and dad splitting up um, and it was quite a nasty one because Mm. my dad was um, a bit abusive to my mum. You know, there was kind of stuff going on there. But you've got to remember, I was very, very young. So a lot of what I probably remember was was put in there via a story. Um, But I remember once once dad left and and, uh, mum was holding down three to four jobs, um, you know, because she didn't get any benefits or anything. So my mum was working all the hours God sends to to pay the mortgage and to put food on the table and stuff. So, you know, it was a very day-to-day, hand-to-mouth sort of way. But it was amazing. It was. Hmm. Um, and then my, my mum met my, what was, you know, to be my stepfather. And um, I was eight years old. And um, he just, he, it started off where he started paying me more attention because I was a really, really good runner. And even at that age, they knew that I was very sporty because the rest of them, not really. It was just me. Um, and I was very sport orientated and I was quite, quite an affectionate, loving sort of child. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about going up and giving someone a hug because everybody knew everywhere where I, where I grew up. So it wasn't, it wasn't even frowned on, you know, and I never felt unsafe. Um, but then my my stepfather started, um, you know, he'd buy me, as I was getting older, he'd buy me the best of everything, but he wouldn't do anything for the other kids. Mm. Um, they used to be jealous about it, but they didn't realize what I had to go through to get that pair of Adidas running spikes or, the, you know, the, the latest sweat um, track suits that the, that the England runners were wearing. They, he, they, the rest of the kids would be so jealous, but they didn't understand that my stepfather was abusing me, mm. uh, you know, from the age of eight to the age of 15, I ran away at 15 because, um, I couldn't handle it. I just generally just couldn't, you know, the arguments cause my mum didn't know anything about it. So, you know, my mum couldn't understand why I was being a complete bitch. Mm. Um, because obviously as I was getting older, I was starting to react different to the abuse that I was suffering. And, um, wow. you know, there was certain situations that I would, um, like mum would go, oh, go with, go with your stepdad or go with, cause she used to call him dad, go with your dad up to Yorkshire and go, cause we had a new house, go and pick up the new carpets. And it didn't matter how much I said, oh, mum, I don't really want to go. Oh, go on, Brian loves you. Go on, go on, go on. Um, knowing full well that we'd have to stay at his mother's house and that his, my room was up in the attic and it was a very easy access wow. to get to me up into the attic because the room that they'd given him was a partition wall up in the attic. Mm. So he was in the same room as me, but it was partitioned off. So it was, you know, as, as I got, got older and, and, and everything like that, I, um, I started to react quite, quite badly to it. And I was, I was quite nasty. I, um, it, I was a problem child um, that that's what I was put down to uh, behavioral and and every every other problem that they can put a, a name to I was classed as um, you know I, I I wet the bed until I was eleven or twelve years old because I was too scared to 
leave the bedroom or go down because the bedroom, his bedroom was right directly underneath mine. So I would rather wet the bed and suffer the con- consequences from my mum wow. than go down past his because that's where he used to spend a lot of his time. So it was like, <sighs> you know, it was quite, quite, it was, it was bad. It was bad. Um, but then I, I left home. I, I ran away from home at 15 and went and lived on the streets, but I wasn't um, a streetwise sort of kid. I, um, I was kind of a little bit of a mouse. I would hide up, hide out the way anywhere that I could be in a shadow where people wouldn't see me. People wouldn't know me. People wouldn't have anything you know, I couldn't acknowledge anybody. I didn't want to speak to anybody. And, um, yeah, I used to steal off doorsteps and, you know, cause in those days the milkman used to put stuff out on the doorsteps, you know, you could get everything from yogurts to fruit to bread, everything, uh, fresh orange juice. So I used to go around, I used to follow the milkman round and, um, I used to get food and drink that way, you know? Um, but it's, you do, you just do what you have to yeah. do to survive. And then I remember, um, I decided I was going to try and get a job. So I went to the local swimming baths and I, I washed my hair and um, I, I actually stole some clothes out of a shop, um, a black uh, skirt, long pencil skirt and a white top. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember going into a solicitor's with my hair all done and I'd stolen makeup because I, was, I wasn't very old, but I just needed to, to do it. Yeah. And I managed to walk into a solicitor's and um, I managed to con them into um, giving me a, a YTS scheme, which is a young training scheme, youth training scheme for when I was I was younger. And the wages was £29.50 for the first year and £31.50 for the second year. But at the end of it, you would come out as a qualified or at least an office junior level. So I managed to con this solicitor into, even though I had no home, I had nowhere. Wow. I was living on the streets. I... Um, I used to wait for the postman at an address that I'd given. And if there was any mess- letters for me, I used to take them. So, you know, that's how I managed to get round. Um, Cause in those days it was, uh, you used to get pay uh, like checks, but they were cash. Mm-hmm. So you could go into and just cash them. So, uh, I, I kind of done that. Well, after about six months, seven months, I realized that there was a loophole in the YTS scheme and they were underpaying me. Because I'd left home and I'd given them an address that wasn't my parents, um, I managed to um, managed to take the solicitor to court, and I came out in this is like the eighties with uh, just under eight hundred pounds. Wow, uh, so <laughs> a lot of money, which was enough for me to be able to set up, yeah. you know, and get myself on my feet. Um, because obviously, I'd had it, I'd had it rough. I walked out of there went to the bank to cash my check and got beaten up and the money got stolen off me. No way. Yeah, I got, I got mugged and all the money got taken away from me. So again, I was back on the streets, um, you know, living hand to mouth again. And then one of my friend's parents, um, like said to me, look, you know, um, I'll, I'll lend you the 116 pounds money, uh, bond money that you need to go into this bed sit but you have to pay it back and you have to get a job. And, um, like she done that. So it was like, right. Okay. So then I was only about just over 16. So she was my guarantor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember, um, I got into, uh, like drugs, you know, not so much like the amphetamines and speeds and the cocaines and the, and the pills and everything. It was, I was never that game, but I used to, um, smoke weed. Well, mm-hmm. it was, it was hash, hashish in those days. And then, um, I remember getting friendly with one of the girls cause I managed to get my job, uh, a job in a pizza in pizza hut. Mm-hmm. And across the road, to hut, there was a curry house and I got really friendly with the girl that used to wait tables there. Um, so when she found out that when I found out she smoked and I smoked, uh, I said to her, look, you know, can we go and get some? Oh yes, of course. She said, yeah, we'll go and get some. So she took me to this house and she said, you've got to wait here because the dealer won't want you to go around. You're not allowed there because he doesn't know your face, but you have to stay here. Okay, no problem. They asked me if I wanted a coffee. I said yes. And they'd laced the coffee with red milk. <gasps> it was, I spent three days in an abandoned house being gang raped for over three days. What? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was it was horrendous. It wait, was horrendous. Wait, it wait, was, uh, wait. She set you up. Yeah. Oh my god. She set me up. 
it was all a ploy. The whole thing was a ploy. So I get, because obviously my, your brain works, but your body doesn't. It just doesn't. Um, so I remember being put in the back of a car, um, not being able to move because it's like you're paralyzed, but your brain still works. It's wow. a very good feeling. Um, and they, they took me out of the car and put me just in a room upstairs. And then they just come and go, you know, oh, uh, I got kicked and urinated on. And, you know, I, it was, it was, yeah, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't yeah. good. It wasn't a good time. Um, but they kept me drugged up, you see. And then they, they, when they had their fill of me, they put me in a car and then threw me on the side of the road. And this little old girl, she must've been, she must have been in her 80s. And it's really weird because this is the most vivid, even though I remember everything that went on, um, the most vivid thing of the whole thing I can remember is the lady's face. As, I, as I'm coming round, I can see her right close to my face. And um, she's saying, I don't think she's dead. Or no, I don't think they're dead. And they couldn't work out if I was a man or a woman. Oh so God. this lady was... Um, she went, there was a phone box and she went to the phone box and she rang an ambulance and I actually came round, um, two days later in the hospital. And, um, that's when they realized I like the old lady did come up though. She did come up to see me. She wow. did. And, um, she didn't know whether I was a boy or a girl, but once she came and saw me and she saw that I was a girl, um, you know, she just said, you need to tell people what happened to you. But I couldn't because because I had gone to that place with a girl for drugs, I right. thought I was going to be arrested for it because I was very young. And obviously I knew that what I was doing was bad. So I just, I just dealt with it. And, um, you know, it was because I was petrified. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to deal with it. And I, and because it was, um, I, you know, I was going up there to go and buy some, some hash. It was just, you know, but I never, I, I couldn't have anything to do with those, those people again. And I had to leave the work because every time I went out from work, they would be there. Um, what? I remember, yeah, I remember talking to her and going, I know what you did to me. And he went, we'll do something about it. But they, they knew that, I mean, I was just a kid. Right. I was just a kid. So then from there, I left there and walked down the road and I, I, I walked into a, um, a football club. And I went in there and asked them for a job. And I still had the black skirt and the white shirt. So um, they taught me how to become a silver service waitress. Mm. And um, I managed to learn the trade there. And I was really good at it. That was something I was always doing the top table. But then the manager took a shine to me. And um, I, you know, I was raped by the manager. Oh, my one night God. With, this, yeah. is, this is unbelievable. Um, yeah, so it was like, oh, at this, by the time I, I was 18, I'd been raped twice, gang raped once, and then sexually abused by my stepfather. And um, my life as a, as a general, I thought was over. You know, I tried to, um, I tried to commit suicide. Um, I'd taken pills and knocked it down with cough mixture. I tried everything. And always somebody managed, because I didn't tell anybody, um, somebody always managed to get me, even when I was unconscious, they, I still wake up in a hospital and it was just, um, wow. such a like, Oh God, you know, like someone up there definitely wants me to survive. Yeah. And I came down to where we live now. I came down to Norfolk, which is where, um, where we live now. And I got myself a job on a, on a holiday camp. And, um, what you do there is you, you kind of stay on site. So they give you a chalet, they give you a wage, um, you know, you get food tickets and stuff, so you don't have to pay for food or anything. And I kind of, I went there and I'd only been there. I started there on April the 7th, 1990. I'm no, yeah, 1990. And I met my soon to be husband on April the 14th of 1990. Mm -hmm. And he walked in and I saw him and you've got to remember, I was petrified of men. I was petrified of sexual advances. I was, yeah. I was just, an, I was an absolute wreck. And then this guy walked in and, um, I don't know. There was just something. I just knew no matter what I was going to be with this man. This man was, was my savior. He was the one that was going to take me away from all this and complete me. And I knew, and all I did was hid some, a piece of chicken underneath some salad for it was underneath some chips. <laughs> and we hadn't even spoken. We just, we just looked at each other. He was a lot older than me. And, and I just, 
I was a little 18 year old girl and he was a 38 year old wrestler. And by the time he'd come to me and said that he wanted some chicken on his plate and I'd hidden the chicken underneath the chips so he didn't have to pay for it. And then I walked around with him and I used my staff card to give him a discount. Even when he sat eating, he turned to face me and we could not take our eyes off each other. Aww. The following day, he was um, he was at a camp and I went with my friends. I didn't know he was there. And I went with my friends and he was there. And two weeks later, he asked me to marry him. We'd, been to, we'd known each other for six weeks. Wow. And that was... That was back, way back in 1990, and then 91, Zach was born, 92, Soraya was born. I'd adopted three children from his previous marriage, and then by the time of 1992, I was a mother of five. Wow. So, and you were, so you were, what, nine, uh, 20 years old? Oh, 20, yeah. When Soraya was born, I was, uh, what was I? I was, I born 71. So, yeah, I was 21 when I had Soraya, 20 when I had Zach. Um, so I was 18, just turning 19 when I met, when I met Rick. And um, to be fair to him, he's protected me. We've been together 28 years and he's protected me every single one of those 28 years. That's amazing. So, you know, for a girl that was pretty messed up and had the worst sort of time growing up, you know, life of, of abuse and living on streets and going without food and stealing from places just to survive to, um, you know, being unconditionally loved mm-hmm. after thinking that I'd been thrown away. To be unconditionally loved is is just something that is uh, is a gift. But how did and, you uh, handle? How did you handle um, all of that? Especially because you said you didn't talk to anybody about it. You obviously didn't go to counseling or anything. And no. that's and that's a lot because some people are messed up just from being raped one time. I mean, here, like you said, you're gang raped, you're regular raped twice, and then you molested. How the hell did you get through all of that? Um, I don't know. I I couldn't tell you now. I know that I'm the way I am today because of it. Um, I'm strong, I'm pig-headed, stubborn. Um, as soon as I feel any danger around me whatsoever, I am. I'm. I'm I come out fighting. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I think it has molded me. I have to be in control of of everything I do and everything those around me do. And it sounds really, really bad, but I have to know their next move before they make it. Mm-hmm. So you know, I'm very, very. Um, conditioned now, but that's explainable. Yeah, I can. I, you know, there is stuff that's that's made me the way I am today. Um, but I think, I think the difference between the fear and the um, the anxiety and the, I mean, the, just being petrified every day of my life from the age of eight to being eighteen and all of a sudden finding somebody that broke every mold that I had of people in general and how nasty and, and, uh, you know, sexualized and everything that they are, um, to find somebody that put their arm around me and say, look, you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want anything from me. I mean, you know, he waited until I was ready to have sex. Once he realized my story, he, he was very, he was awesome. Like absolutely awesome. Everything was taken slow. Um, you know, he he asked me to marry him straight away, and and he's kept his promise to me. You know that nothing would ever happen like that to me again. And you know, I can I can honestly, hand on heart, say that that whenever Rick is around me, I feel more safe than than anything. But there's there's still certain aspects of my childhood that will always live with me, and it shaped and molded me. And I do not, I don't for the life of me know how I'm here with you today telling you about it as if it's a story without a tear, without any anger, without anything. I think um, I'm not going to feel guilty for other people's sins. I'm not. Mm, Everything that happened to me was somebody else's choice. Right. I was part and parcel of that choice, but I I did not have a choice. And I am not going to spend my life regretting what I could have, should or would have done. At the time, I couldn't do anything about it. There was nothing in my life that could make, have made it stop. Um, it was something, it was the card that I was dealt. And um, once I realized that, I did take my stepfather to court. I did get him done. Oh, really? I still have the paperwork. Yep. He, he got arrested for it and, you know, um, he got charged with it and everything. So, and he admitted it. He actually admitted it. He held wow. his hands up to it and said, yes, I did do it. So, you know, there's a resolution for everything. And, 
I remember earlier on you said that you believe that every cloud is a silver lining. Well, even the darkest cloud has got the silver lining. And I am living proof that it doesn't matter how bad things get and how, how lost you feel. There is always, always a way you can stand up. And, but it's, you've got to do it yourself. Yeah. There's no magic cure out there. You've just got to like suck it up, princess. And I always say, chin up, tits out. Show the world <laughs> that it doesn't bother you even if it does. You know, wow. and that and that's how I've lived my life. That's how I've done it. That is amazing. And right now I know that you're helping somebody out there who's, you know, gone through this and doesn't even know how to handle it. And that is something that I, I commend you, first of all, for speaking about it. And it seems to me that by you speaking, you're actually feeling better in that telling your story, like you're, um, that's the way yeah. that I'm feeling. Like, it's just like, it's getting it out. And that's the same thing that Mickey James shared when she came on my podcast and she talked about how she'd been molested, something that she had kind of not told anybody about. And then she got to the point yeah. when she spoke to me, she said, I am tired of acting like this was my fault. I'm tired of hiding. Oh, yeah. Well, I believe, um, even in the most traumatic times, uh, I mean, I can speak about it now as a story because there's no emotion attached to it. Because over the years, I, I, I can spot a, a, an abuse victim a mile off. Mm. I can tell by their eyes if they've been sexually, physically or mentally or emotionally abused. Mm. It, you, you carry yourself as a different way. And mine is a story to me now that's non-emotional because I've spoken about it so many times because to get someone to open up, Sometimes you've got to share a bit of yourself. Yes. And I've shared my story so many times to so many people to, to get them to open up so that I can deal with it. I mean, for example, um, the beginning of the year, there is um, a, a, a child um, that came to me and they've got a, they've got a, a brilliant parents, brilliant family. Um, you know, everything is, is perfect in their lives. Like literally they're, they're, really loving family, but that child admitted to me that he was being abused by a member of the family that was not immediate. Mm -hmm. And straight away, it's like, you know, cause I, I kind of, you know, there was a couple of things that had been said and I, I pulled him and I said, look, you know, um, everyone has a story to tell and everyone has a secret, but it's, it's there's a big difference between your secret and holding someone else's secret. Are you holding anyone's secret? Mm. and he just looked at me and burst into tears and then but I knew I knew so like now he's you know he's, he's obviously going through it um I'm there for the family I'm there for the child I'm there for it all but the hardest thing about it is is I'm seeing both sides of a coin here I'm seeing the child and how it affects them so that's me but I'm also seeing how it's affected the mum, the dad the brothers the sisters and the immediate relations right so I'm seeing my mum's point of view um, to, to knowing that there's a paedophile in the, in the family that is something that you would never even think of. Um, so, so it's, it's quite hard for me at the moment because I've got to be there for the court case. I have to be there, um, for the child, um, and the parents and stuff because I got the ball rolling because it was me that initially went to the police. Um, but it's, it's hard to relive my past because it's there. There's nothing I can do about it. Right. Um, and to see a child going through and the trauma and the tears. But the, the good, the silver lining in this is I know that that child will come out okay. Mm -hmm. I know that that child is at an age that they've spoken out, which is something I could never do. So that child is braver than me. So I now know that if that child gets the right counseling and talks about it so it becomes a story, I know that that child will be messed up. Wow. But that child, it took so much bottle for that for that child to kind of, at the age that he is, to actually come out and, and say that. And I had to wait until I was um, in my early 30s. So, you know, and, and we're talking about, uh, you know, a, a young child, right. like 12. And wow. how how amazingly brave but then but the, it is he it, like me and him now have connected and and like he talks to me and even though it's really hard to listen to really 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 difficult you you know i'm there with my arm around him and we talk and you know it takes me a, a good day and a half afterwards to kind of re-establish my brain and the little boxes i've kind of even though the doors are open the boxes are still there I get it. um so you have to kind of reassess yourself you know like Put, put your clothes in order and cock your hat and pull your collar up and go, right, it's okay. 
it's all right. We've yeah. got through it. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a gift. What? I went through my, my, my past, I think to help people now. Yeah, no, that is, it's a, it's an amazing thing to do is you got to figure out a way to pay it forward so somebody else can get rescued maybe even earlier. And, you know, like you're helping this kid now and how to handle it moving forward. I do want to ask you, because I had read somewhere that you did not have a relationship with your mother because you couldn't forgive her. Uh, did your mom know? And do you, are you able to now have a relationship? Cause now you're seeing the other side of things. Yeah, it's really strange because me and my mum now are extremely close. Really? Um, I Yeah, yeah. No, we are inseparable now. Um, yes, I blamed her. Um, I felt that, you know, there were scenarios where there's no way she couldn't have known. There's no way, you know, and I was I was on my, my soapbox and it was like, as a mother, as a mother, you would know. And um, there, it's wrong. It's wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, um, she didn't know. She couldn't have known. You know, as soon as she found out, the first thing she'd done was kicked him out and divorced him. Mm. You know, she lost she lost contact with her other children over this. Wow. Like literally, like she's she's bought five children and myself and my brother are the only two out of the five that actually speaks to her. And she she took my side and fought my corner to the point where she had nothing left to give. Wow. And that is physically, mentally, emotionally, in any way, shape or form. My mum stopped her life to to back mine. And, you know, all the, the doubts. I mean, I've spoken to my mum about some really hard stuff, really hard stuff. Um, but that was in the early days because we hadn't spoken for like years. Yeah. Um, I still haven't spoken to my older sister for like nearly 20 years. Wow. Um, and yeah, no, there's still a huge... There's a, st- a huge elephant in the room when it comes to my siblings and my my actual um, blood family. Do you know, they my not heritage. believe that it happened? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Even though, even though it's um, you know, I've got the evidence and, and the court case, it. and and he admitted <laughs> it. He actually he done a full confession on my on my mobile phone, and I I sent him to answering machine. Thank God I did because he then done a full. Um, you know, confession yeah. on the answer machine. I ran straight to the police station. I went, lift it, lift it, lift it, because it was my word against his. And you know, before then, right? And then, you know, it was like, and there it was, my my confession after all of these years of, of disbelief. Yeah. But then, you know, when when Mum stood up for me and everything, because I was the black sheep. I was the I was the one that should shall not be named. I was like Voldemort in the Harry Potter series. Wow. Um, you know, and my mum. My mum literally turned her back on the world and everything in it to be by my side. Mm. So, you know, as much as um, I and I hated her, I did. I, I hated like all of them. They I was I was outcast. I didn't want anything to do with my blood, my family, my aunties, like none of them. I hated them all because none of them were there to stop the abuse that I'd suffered. And, you know, I had a real bad, bad attitude when it came to to the, the family in general. Um, but like now it's like my mum is my life. She's yeah. my, she, you know, she's, I ring her three or four times a week just to let her know that I'm cool. And that, you know, if there's anything she needs, I, you know, I make sure that, that she's got it. And yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice. Do Even you though, wish, do you wish that you had that relationship with the rest of your siblings? Like that you could mend that? I, I think it's gone past that, to be honest. Um, I think because I'm I'm 47 in like like two weeks, less than two weeks. Um, and the nearer I get to 50, the more the, the more I kind of think, do I do I care anymore? Mm, yeah. They've not been there for most of my life, and you know, in fact, I've lived most of my life already, and they haven't been there for the hard times. So why should they be there for the good? You know, yeah. and and. I'm not saying that I'm angry with them. I'm just nothing. I just, just nothing. You know, somebody, I'm just not, just, I want to share something with you real quick. Somebody shared with me that I feel it was so powerful. They said, you know, take the label off, like take the label off mom and dad, take the label off brother, sister, take, you know, all of that. And look at the people for who they are. Are they people that empower you, that love you, that, you know, believe in you, that cherish you, that um, lift you? 
If the answer is yes, then yeah, you want a relationship with them. If it's not, you don't want a relationship with them and you don't have to worry about the label that's been on them. So yeah. I feel like that's I what you're saying. You know, these, they're, yeah, yeah in, in the label, they're sister or brother or whatever, but, but are they people that have lifted you, been there, all of that? No. So it's okay. And it's, and it's fine because, and it's not like saying there's something wrong with them either. They're dealing with it the way they're dealing with it, but you have to move. Yeah. On. Everyone dealt with it different. You know, um, there was anger, there was aggression, there was disbelief. There was, you know, there was so much stuff that went on that, it's just got to the stage now where, I mean, I'm not saying I can't be in a room with them because I can, because I, I'm really just nonplussed, nonplussed yeah. by it. You know, I've got my, my family is my children and my husband. Mm -hmm. They are what I live for. They're what I breathe for. My grandchildren, my great grandchildren. I, um, if I've got a problem, I go to my kids. If I've got a problem I can't go to my kids for, obviously I tell my husband everything, so I'll, I'll go to Rick. Right. Um, you know, I I find it very hard to to have friends, um, actual uh, long term friends. I've got many acquaintances and many mates in wrestling, and you know, I've got some 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 good friends. I have got some good friends, but I don't. I I'm not very good. I'm not the best friend in the world. Okay. Um, you know, I I. My, my focus is my husband and my kids and yeah. my grandkids. So I don't have room for anything else. Um, I know like, cause I have to work. Right. So it's work family and my family, because mine was so destructive and, um, fragmented. Um, uh, I, I work my heart off to make sure that my, my kids and my, you know, like my husband, I'll be with my husband to the day I die. Yeah. Like literally there's, there's nothing, there's, there's no splitting for my, my, my fella and my kids, you know, they, there is no way on this earth that I would ever allow my kids to a not talk to each other, b not be part of it. They can fall out, they can fight, but they can't blank each other. Mm -hmm. I will not stand for it. It's we're a family unit and we do things together and, you know, we have our differences and we, we do knock heads and, you know, there's sometimes we think, Oh, I need space. Jesus Christ. I need space. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, <laughs> space is all right. <laughs> But it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to be angry at your brother. It's okay to be angry at your sister. It's not okay to blank them for it. Right. Because you have to talk and communication is the key to everything. Everything. It's literally the key to everything. It's it, explanation, communication. That is how you move forward and that's how you, you get on, you know, and that even if you're angry, talk in the, in the silence. Once there's the anger, there's the silence. Once the silence is done, that's the gray area. That's the space you talk. Do not let that opportunity go because one minute you haven't spoken for two days and the next minute it's 20 years yeah. and you cannot cover that time. It's true. You can't. It's true. I want so, you so to talk to me about something real quick um, because you said you were, you know, you've been very, very close and all, but Paige, when she came on originally to the show, she talked about something that happened. I believe she said it was when she was 10 years old that you actually ran away for like six months and how oh, hard that was for her. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah. me what happened there that all of a sudden you had to just walk away from your family. Um, it was an overload of everything. I think that was the moment that everything hit me like a ton of bricks from every direction. Um, and once you feel that all your avenues have been blocked, you, it, you know, you, you, you think that, you know, you're either going to do yourself in or you've got to get out. Um, is it something that triggered it or, or like, was there something going yeah. on at that time? Yeah, no, there, there was, but it's, it's, it's kind of, we're, you know, we're stepping into a realm of too personal. Um, no, no problem. No problem. I, yeah, I respect that. Um, I respect that. Yeah. Uh, there was stuff that was going on. Um, a lot of stuff that was going on and, um, I was extremely fragile and my brain just went pop. Wow. It yeah. just did. And, there, and, there, and I couldn't remember really anything about, you know, I, I, it was very strange. It was, it was like, uh, if anybody has suffered a nervous breakdown, then they'll understand exactly what I mean. It's like an out of body experience, even though you're living, you're breathing, you're walking, you're talking, yeah. it's not you. Yeah. You're going through emotion and your brain doesn't work right. And your memories are muddled and things don't, don't click into place. It's just, it's, it's very surreal. And, um, and blessing my husband wouldn't have it. He, he found me. He, um, 
you know, got like placated me and managed to get my head sorted out and got me back. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's amazing. So, yes. Yeah, the, she told me. Yeah, bless her. Yeah, no, she told me how she <clears throat> she found out from because somebody recognized you and told them, and and her and her brother went, to, and then you know your fa- I mean your husband too, and and what that was like. But I, you know, it's so easy for people to judge, to criticize, to point fingers, all of that, and I always oh. say stop it, cut it out. You don't know what somebody is going through. You have right, no idea. Everyone's house with a skeleton. Everyone, everyone has that. Everyone, Absolutely. It and yeah. everyone's got their point or their breaking point. And, and, and there are people that have gone through, you, my dear, have gone through way more in your life than I have. And I can't, I'm, I'm like in awe that you have been able to go through all of that because I mean, yeah, one of my fears is getting raped. And I remember dating a guy that actually started forcing himself on me. And if it wouldn't have been for my roommate, when I yelled out her coming from the back and him running out, I don't know what would have happened. And so it is a real fear. And the fact that you've endured it multiple times and then from a stepbrother and all, wow. It seems like, um, because I went through so much, it seemed like the norm. It sounds really strange, you know, but you know, every everyone everyone's got a past, everyone's got a cross to bear. Um, you know, it's how you deal with it. You can yeah. either make it empower you or you can you can make it break you. So you can either be a victim or you know, you can be an aggressor. And I chose I chose to, to you know march forward and make sure that it never happened to me again. Now I've got a choice and I'm a I'm an adult and I'm a woman. Yeah. I never put myself in a situation that I did when I was a child. So it's given me hindsight, which is val- is valuable. And, you know, for all of Soraya's tribulations that she's going through, you know, all of the bad stuff, it's a story. It's yeah. a memory. It's, it's, it's also an empowerment because yeah. it's a very, very valuable lesson. It's a life lesson. And there's not very many times in your life that you actually learn a life lesson. And when you do, you take it with both hands and you never allow that situation to happen again. Right. And that's what she needs to do. She needs to learn her life lessons. They're the big catastrophes that's happened in her life. They're there for a reason. They're there to knock her onto the right path. And she has to learn from them. And that's what I said to her. And that's what I say to anybody that's going through it. Please just ride it. Time is a great healer. It also speeds stuff up and it doesn't matter what you're going through at the minute. You can stop it. You can prevent it. You can deal with it and then you can talk about it and mm-hmm. then it empowers you. It's a, you have to take, make a positive out of a negative. And so a, a page, she will do that. Yeah, she well, she's been do. doing that. She's been doing that alone with just, you know, the way that she spoke about everything and the message that she was even saying to other women, don't let yourself get recorded and don't be taking, you oh, know, God, all, yeah. all this stuff because, yeah, phones can get hacked like hers was hacked and things can get out there. And she said it. She said, I was doing it to please someone else and I should I. I knew better. And so it was great that she's teaching that lesson and that's the bottom line. And that's yes. what I love. Cause Stone Cold said so. <laughs> there you go. What Between a- the two of us, we wrap that stuff. That's brilliantly. <laughs> I love it. Well, I tell you what, Soraya, you've really been an amazing, uh, incredible story. I will say, I, I thank you. I thank you because you didn't have to share it. And I had the ghosts as well in my childhood. Mm. I was terrorized by oh, spirit. Really? So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was absolutely terrorized by them growing up. Wow. So, okay. We are a day another story yes we're definitely gonna have to have you back because you you've got some stories on you but you're just so powerful and that's the thing I just your voice just your energy I love it I love it and I (laughs) thank you for working so hard in the independent circuit because seriously if it wasn't for for you and for the other women in the independent circuit to like just continue to break through into such a male-dominated sport we wouldn't be where we are today so that's why I wanted to do the show I'm extremely proud to be a female wrestler in the world right at this moment. My only guttering thing really is that I'm in the twilight years, but I am extremely proud to be a, a female wrestler. And, Please don't say you know, you're in the twilight years. 
<laughs> well, they were, oh, come on, I'm nearly 50. Um, but no, I'll go as long as I'm relevant for. Um, and obviously, I'm more relevant because of who Raya is. Um, you know, if you can't get paid, get a mum. Um, so obviously, she's made my career extend a lot, um, which I will, I do thank her for. I mean, I'm, I, I know that, that she has helped my career and boosted it. You know, it was, I'm not saying I, that if she hadn't made it big, I don't know where I'd be in the wrestling business now. So it's because of her that I think I've, that I've had the longevity as long as I've had it, but I will definitely, I will ride the wave for as long as the wave is there because um, I'm addicted that's great. It's like my name is Soraya Knight and I'm addicted to wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Amen, sister. How do we find you on social media? Um, well, well, my Twitter is Will Soraya K. Um, my Facebook is kind of off limits because I keep that to my, my family and stuff because that's where my grandchildren's pictures are. Yeah. But head over to my Instagram, Soraya Knight 1910. Um, I guarantee there's, there's odd wrestling folk, uh, photographs, but usually it's really dodgy memes okay. because, um, I think Instagram is about personality. Um, Twitter is about business and Facebook is about personal. So you get to it, see inside the mind of an absolute crazed lunatic on my Instagram. <laughs> so, um, I love but, it. Um, up there though if anybody needs to talk about any sort of abuse whether it be physical mental emotional in any way shape or form if they email sweet soraya at hotmail.com i 100 percent will be there i will help wow. you i will talk with you we'll run through stuff if you're legitimate and this has actually happened because i'll know um i'm quite i've got no problem of what way of walk of life you're in i will 100 percent I will 100% listen to you and, and help you through if needed. Wow. So that's powerful. And that's to anybody. I've, I've got, I'm, I'm just a council house girl. So I've got no delusions of grandeur. That's amazing. So if anybody needs somebody to talk to outside of their block, then absolutely drop me a message. Okay. So again, that's sweet Soraya at hotmail.com. That's the one. Yes. Perfect. So, you know, if anybody needs anything, they know that they can, they can reach out. Okay. So thank you. No problem. It's been awesome. Chasing glory with Lillian Garcia. Wow. What an interview. I told you guys it was going to be powerful. So am I right? Like all the things that this woman has endured And yet she has been resilient enough to get through it. She has raised a family and she continues to be a strong mom, continues to have her career as an independent wrestler and loves it, loves it. You can tell she absolutely loves it and has so much respect for the business and so much knowledge that she's giving out there. And then also being able to help so many people. I mean, the fact that she even gave away an email for any of you guys that are experiencing this and please... I really will tell you right now, don't hesitate to reach out if you're going through this. You're not alone. Please, there are people out there like her that want to help. It gives them a purpose. It allows them to say, you know what? I went through this for a reason because then I can turn around and help someone else. So take them up on it. Don't feel like you have to be living in this misery. So thank you, Soraya, for for being so powerful now and making such a huge difference in somebody else that is in need and for sharing and being so open about your story. And I love that. The more open we are, guys, the less the story can uh, can hurt us, right? It doesn't hurt us anymore. Like she said, it just becomes a story. It's something that has happened. And now we could turn around and and then, you know, empower somebody else with it. That's what we're all here for. So thank you so much. I love you dearly, man. I could tell, I I could, I could just hang out with you every weekend. I wish that you lived close by. (laughs) So I want to continue following your career. And of course, Paige's career is just awesome. So as we forge through to evolution, October 28th, so exciting, such a big milestone. It's so incredible. So until then, guys, make sure that you follow at Chasing Glory Podcast on Instagram. Follow me at Lillian Garcia with one L in the middle on Instagram and Twitter and Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. And make sure you follow my YouTube channel too, youtube.com slash Lillian Garcia. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to ask you to do, please, is make sure that you rate this right now. Look at your phones. You'll see the little five-star thing. 
give it five stars if you think it is. And that's what uh, we have the rating so far, five stars. I really appreciate that. And write a little review, even if it's one or two lines. And every Saturday we post some of the reviews up at Chasing Glory Podcast. So do that. So rate, review, subscribe. If you subscribe to the show, you immediately get the message when the show is uploaded and ready to go. All right. So until then, I love you guys. Much peace, love, and passion. And remember to always be yourself and trust that it's enough. Ah, later. Thanks for joining us here on Chasing Glory from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends and be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows.